Hello viewers, welcome to History and Lowell. I'm Maritza Grooms and I'm here with my buddy, my favorite professor, Bob Forant. How are you today, Bob? I'm well, I've even got a somewhat holiday-ish tie on. Yeah, so oh, I love it. Make sure they can <laughs> catch it. <laughs> Lowell has a lot of exciting things happening and one of those exciting things happened last night mm -hmm. at a city council meeting, something that we've been talking about for quite some time on our show. Um, and we've celebrated this over time about how Lowell is such a welcoming place for folks of all different backgrounds, immigrants, refugees, everybody. But last night, there was a vote. What was that vote about? So the Secretary of, through President Trump and the Secretary of State's office, an executive order was issued some months ago saying that changing the way refugees can be admitted into the United States. Mm. And up until this executive order, if people were being resettled through agencies, we had a few shows back, Emma Tobin from the International Institute talking about this, that people are in a refugee camp, a legally recognized refugee camp, they get processed and then they can be resettled in European countries, um, or in the United States, and people would arrive, but into Lowell or um, Nashua or mm -hmm. wherever, up in Bangor, Maine, wherever it might be. But the, this new executive order said that you had to, the, the community had to vote to opt in to accepting refugees. Mm. Uh, so it, and it created a deadline of the end of this year to do it, or in effect, you were in a way saying you did not want to admit refugees into your community. Oh, wow. um, and so the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Charlie Baker, mayor of Boston, other people have you know, said, you know, we have to do these things and at the, go at the state level, but still communities at the grassroots level have to do it as well. And so city manager Eileen Donahue wrote a letter essentially saying such but it had to be uh, voted on and approved by the city council. She couldn't just do her own executive order. Right. Um, unlike what the president can do. And so what's interesting though is his executive order is now being fought through the courts. Mm. It was, the legality of it was challenged and now it's working its way through the courts. Who knows where it, it may end up in the Supreme Court. It's hard to, it's difficult to say, but last night the city council was gonna vote on the motion and so there had been a lot of interest in the city talk back and forth about what the city council might or might not do mm -hmm. and then last night at the meeting there were I, I was at the meeting and I wrote down all the different organizations that were there M most of the organizations somebody from them spoke but the International Institute the, the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association mm -hmm. the Africa Center um, the Lowell Community Health Center, Coalition for Better Acre, Elliott Church, Merrimack Valley Project, and on and on and on. And then a lot of people also gave personal testimony who had come as refugees and told their story of being in a refugee camp and ending up in Lowell. So it was a really interesting meeting. It was a good sort of slice and way when I was thinking we were gonna do the show again this morning, the night, the morning after, it was thinking, wow, it's sort of like the microcosm of many of the shows we've done, and a lot of people who spoke are people we've had on as guests. <laughs> That's so awesome. And so it was really, it was like a flashback of sort of what we've been doing. So it was a, it was a pretty powerful meeting. Yeah, I bet. Oh, and, and when I, just hearing the organizations that were there, I think of Lowell in and of itself. That's what Lowell is when I think about what we do here and the community that we have. All of those folks are affected by mm -hmm. this we are affected by this directly yep. and our wonderful wonderful mill city is affected by this directly yeah and the room was full even though it was still icy and snowy the, the gallery was full as well in the upper balcony and it was totally packed on the oh, wow. on the downstairs um as well and so it was really quite remarkable i found it really right i found it uplifting in a way, considering the sort of debates and arguments we've been having in the country on what yeah. to do. And it was also interesting because we were, yesterday, what, so there's a lot of history in these two days that relates in a way. 
So yesterday, um, in 1944, d December 17, 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the internment of the Japanese during the Second World oh. War. And so I was thinking, I made remarks last night, and I used that as part of a remark to say we got it wrong once before, probably we ought to rethink what we're doing. Um, and as well, I made reference to what we've talked about here before too, which is the denial of Jewish refugees mm -hmm. entry into the United States who are trying to escape the Holocaust. And these, both of those two things, that denial of Jewish refugees into the country and then rounding up Japanese American citizens as well as legal Japanese immigrants in the country and putting them in internment camps are really these um, blemishes, if you will, um, mm. on the history of the country. And so even though Lowell didn't do either of those things, Lowell had an opportunity to take a vote that would really be interesting in the context of this larger history. And to not vote yes would have been a really interesting sort of statement. And so I've been hiding the punchline, but the vote was 9-0 um, in favor of the city manager <laughs> signing the letter. So it was a really pretty powerful statement um, from the city council. Yeah, and especially we know that this isn't always how things look for our city council. It's, o it's not always a unanimous vote for you know, our immigrants and our refugees are, or our diversity. Mm -hmm. And I think um, as great as that unanimous vote is, I really didn't have that hope initially and I'm <laughs> really glad that lol turned out the way that it did in during a snowstorm. <laughs> right. And I think I mean I do think that we sometimes think well small democ small d democracy like in effect going to a city council meeting mm -hmm. or whatever. I do I don't know if anybody on the council changed their mind mm. after listening, but I would bet that some people on the fence um, at which point some people thought maybe there were three people or maybe even four people. I think listening to people who had been refugees and came into the city in the early 1980s and now sort of talked about, you know, aspirationally what they had, what being in Lowell had meant and what ha how their families had turned out and all of that, and then them advocating and saying we can't stop the train, so to speak. I think that did influence people. And again, I don't know whether when people sat down at the council table to vote, um, if it changed anybody's mind. But I also think it would have been really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> On the other <laughs> hand, in the, in the flavor of the room and the sort of building of the testimony and what people were talking yeah. about, it would have been difficult for somebody to, um, to say no, I think, at that, particular, <laughs> at that particular juncture. So there is something to be said for the council having that process whereby people can speak yeah. on motions and try to at least get a story on the record. And so that was good. I mean, I, I again, sort of like I didn't want to drive down off of uh, my hill in the snow. And right. But I also <laughs> felt like, no, I, ha I really needed to testify. I needed to be there. Yeah. Um, and so, and I also wanted to see. Yeah. Right? I, want, I mean, I could have watched it on TV. That's true too, um, yeah. But I wanted to see, I wanted to, I guess, yeah, you talk about being witness, and so I wanted to be witness. Especially to, I feel like, w everything that we've talked about, your background, this is kind of like a moment in history. Right. And to be present for that. And would you say, do you think that maybe this could potentially be a turning point for us with the blemishes that we've had and with the patterns that we've had over time? I think that the, I think that the history of the city and I think that the way people spoke so eloquently last night, people again giving voice to their own journeys of getting to Lowell and all that, I think that's pretty powerful. So I do think that the more that happens, um, the better equipped everybody involved in the leadership of the city is to actually deal um, in, a, in a humane way um, with these kinds of issues. And I, so I do think that it makes a difference, right? And I think, again, th what we're trying to do with these programs, I feel like it does the same thing for the people that watch, because we're mm -hmm. trying to show that history matters. And again, while the vote isn't going to be life-changing in the bigger picture of the country, it could have mattered to a lot of people if it had been, even if it had been like six to three or five to four, but passed, yeah. it would have been a message in a way mm -hmm. that half 
if you will, of the leadership of the, of the elected leadership of the city felt differently about who these folks were. And so do I think yeah. everybody, you know, that, that we had our own little Christmas miracle on, uh, <laughs> on Merrimack Street last night? Probably not. Um, I don't think there were, I, but I think some people maybe had an epiphany of some sort, keeping in yeah. the religious Christmas, whatever, yeah. <laughs> mode of the day. But again, so, you know, when I started thinking about all of this to talk about this last night, also yesterday is the day in 1951 that Paul Robeson and other African-American leadership of the country, 1951, went to the United Nations with a resolution claiming genocide against African-Americans mm. in the United States to put that case before the UN for I reparations. And, um, you know, again, stuff that we've been talking about. So I was thinking, wow, look at all these the confluence of these things, right? On this that, date. This that on the yeah. 17th is internment's okay legally. Um, and then just a few short, seven years later, here are people petitioning the UN about African-American genocide. And then I looked this morning, which I should have remembered but forgot, um, sometimes it's hard to keep all these dates, but this day in 1865 is when the 13th Amendment is ratified, ending slavery uh -huh. in the United States. So there's this whole like confluence of things. And today also is International Migrants Day. Get out of here. So wow. these two days epitomize in a way like what was happening yeah. in the city last night and really look for me again, sort of located Lowell in this really interesting continuum yeah. of history, right? We think sometimes, well, it's just Lowell. But Lowell <laughs> no. is in the, all these things Lowell is in the middle of in one way or another. From the beginning, it yeah. seems. From the beginning, <laughs> yeah. So it w j just, again, all in that little yeah. space of time. It's really pretty fascinating. Oh my goodness. I'm like, like kind of overwhelmed with that confluence there. And I think that's super, super important that Lowell really is at the crux of all of this. And hopefully we can be a model for the rest of mm -hmm. Massachusetts, for the rest of the country. And I feel like in some ways, when it comes to refugees and immigrants, I think that we try to be, and, and I mean, with the International Institute being here for over 100 years now, I think that that work is kind of really Lowell's work in building yep. that community. And look at the way community turned out. You know I always love a feel good story. And yeah, yeah. like community coming out in the numbers, that's how we get things done. Yep. And I think, I mean, it was interesting because um, Councilwoman Mercier brought up before her vote, she told stories about her own family, and you never always know what yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> How the wind will blow. Um, but then she <laughs> talked about, which was really interesting, she relayed the case of Portuguese immigrants who became refugees in a way because of a mm -hmm. volcano in, in uh, on one of the islands in the Azores. Someone's and been watching our show. And how, <laughs> and how John F. Kennedy basically was approached by Portuguese people in Lowell to say you have to get rid of the quotas and let people come in, and they did. And she related that story, which I found really fa yeah. You know, I was sitting there thinking, oh, okay, Rita. Um, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. You've been doing your homework. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was again, like, you don't, you never go to these meetings knowing exactly what's going to happen, but right. it was interesting. And then most of the, con not all, but most of the counselors relayed a story in their own life of their antecedents wow. having some immigrant story. Um, and so it that. was a moment, right, yeah. where I think that, and again, whether it was caused by all the people in the room, which I think is part of it, and by mm -hmm. the stories that people told, but then people sort of bared their own soul in a way and talked about, you know, their own particular family story from Ireland or from Italy. Yeah. Um, Councilor Milanazzo talked about, you know, his grandfather from Italy coming over as a really young man to, wow. to work on the B&M Railroad. And he told a very personal story about all of that. And, you know, other people did the same. And so it was, it, again, it was like this, it was almost, it was like sharing time. It was like Sesame yeah. Street or something, right? <laughs> it was this really interesting sort of juxtaposition, yeah. again, with all of the crowd in the room. And it was a very diverse crowd, like, of people who had come to, to the meeting. So all of it was like this really interesting tableau, you know, like yeah. I was trying, I didn't have a camera, but I was trying to figure out like, how would you capture it? Well, the camera captured it, so. I know, I know LTC definitely captured it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. So we can catch that yes. if we want to relive that Yeah, yeah, and I moment. think it's worth people 
checking it out and listening to this, yeah. th these deeply personal stories. Gordon Hom talked about, you know, his time coming and his work with the uh, Africa Resource Center and um, people talked from the CMAA, from Low Community Health Center. I mean, it was just this really yeah. interesting. And then you realize the, how those various populations have settled in mm -hmm. and are really these powerful actors in the city now and yeah. what the city would be what the city would be with without them would be I mean it would be reft of a lot of its really interesting folk exactly <laughs> <laughs> our community leaders when I think about who I think leads this community it's always this diverse crew of people who have these really interesting stories of how they got mm -hmm. here and a lot of those people so, well, some of those people have been on our show and we got yes. to hear like very personal stories. Yep. But I think also that other side of things, hearing the anecdotes from our, our actual leaders that we voted in, that probably humanized them in a way that maybe our community wasn't even prepared for or wasn't expecting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really great thing that happened as a result of this really kind of terrible thing that we even had to think about. Why is that even a thought? Why not just, right. why is that not yeah, just, Yeah, and you know, I, I do think do that we, I mean, I, I'm writing right, I'm working right now on writing a history of Lowell immigration. And I think that the more I work on it, the more you can sort of see this story, right? And this, you can see the evidence trail, right? Of s second generation becoming mm -hmm. more involved in a city. And then usually it's the grandkids that are like running for office. And, and you could hear that last night when people yeah. were talking you know, that their grandparents would be proud of them, that they were elected to the city council or whatever. And so you can see that, right? And then when you listen to everybody in the room, they were laying the same trail out, Yeah. right? A lot of them are not like third generation yet, right? But they are <laughs> second generation and there's some third generation. And so we're starting to see on the Lowell City Council, somebody like Vesna Noon and then yeah. other people elected to the council and the school committee in this last election. I mean, so you can see this power of transformation taking place, and it does occur over time. When you go on the second floor of Lowell City Hall, they have these photographs of the various councils over time, um, and you can see it changing. And so when you look at the, the uh, you walk around sort of chronologically, and you can see at the moment where it's starting to change from being a almost exclusively Irish city council by looking <laughs> at, to the best you can, by looking at last names, so now it's Irish, French, Canadian. Then you go a little bit further and you can see it's Irish, French, Canadian. Now there's a couple of Greeks that have snuck yeah. in there, right? And then <laughs> it changes again. And then there's a couple of Portuguese names. And now, you know, now there's names that are obviously, um, you know, Cambodian, Vietnamese mm -hmm. names. And yet, so it's the same thing when you looked at the room and you looked like a lot of people yeah. brought their kids. Oh, yeah. And so you could just, you know, you're looking at that and then you're seeing it. You're seeing wh everything we've done with the program and talking about this history, it was like live last night. Wow, talk about a cumulative exam. <laughs> yeah, oh no, right, you could have, I could have told my students to come to the, come to the room and write your essay based on what you yeah. saw. Yeah, uh, it it's like history, know. living history right yeah, here. Yeah, and actually it's a good idea, I think. I'm teaching immigration history in the spring. I might want to use the, the, yeah. that part of the meeting where people told their stories as like, as like a thing to watch. Totally. In the class because, it, it, yeah, it was, it was deeply personal. It was very moving to listen to people. And the fact that people got up in front of a room full of, for the most part, strangers to them yeah. and told these difficult stories was, you know, people talked about losing everybody in their family, but maybe them and, you know, their mom or them and an aunt or whatever and ending up in Lowell. Wow. Um, that's pretty powerful. And refugee stories are not for the faint of heart. That mm -hmm. I don't think most of us could even fathom just the devastation and the loss that yep. comes with that and then having to rebuild from scratch and we talk about it all the time and we have wonderful organizations like the International Institute that help but after that period of time now you have to kind of fend for yourself and yeah you have about a year of resources through the International yeah. Institute and then you you're supposed to be working and, and being able to pay your rent. And I mean, I talked about in what I said, I mentioned the story. I didn't use the name and I'm not going to use it here, but I was a student of mine who to who wrote her family history in, in uh, my immigration history class. And because she wanted to figure out like what the deal was, like how she ended up here. Yeah. And, you know, her. Um, her mom was in a refugee, a Vietnam refugee camp. Her dad mm. was in a refugee camp after fleeing Cambodia. 
Um, they didn't know each other. They ended up meeting in Lynn um, after being out of refugee camps, ending up in the United States and migrating here and there, and then end up ending up in Lynn, getting married, and then moving to Lowell. <laughs> um, and so, again, it's a very Lowellian yeah, kind so of a story, Lillian. right? And so she <laughs> went through this entire sort of family history in writing her essay. And then it turns out, which she sort of dropped the punchline later, was that she has three sisters who are also students at UMass Law. <laughs> Um, and so there's four sisters in this family. Wow. They're all um, at UMass Lowell. They have a younger brother, and they decided they didn't want him coming to Lowell. I don't know why, but, <laughs> but coming to UMass Lowell. But anyway, so I'm not sure where he has. I think he was a senior last year, or maybe he was a junior at Lowell High. But anyway, it's <laughs> just, again, part of this, you know, this really powerful sort of story. And, and in a good way, I mean, because we can get suckered in, in a way, to the sort of the American dream story right. and the, like all immigrants make it and everything, which isn't obviously the case. Um, but these are powerful examples mm -hmm. of when we, when we get it roughly right. Um, not that it was easy as the first Cambodians came to Lowell. There was a lot of opposition and a lot right. of struggle and, and heartache for people. But nonetheless, they persevered and here we are, yeah. um, you know, some 30 years later. Um, with them taking leadership positions in the in the city, very much like French Canadians or Greeks exactly. or Portuguese, you know, whatever yeah. before them. I always think about those Irish canal diggers. Could they see that maybe, you know, a couple of generations later, they would be yeah. leading the city, being on the city council and leading the way and, and then leading the country? Yep. I bet there's no way that as they're taking that hike from South Boston all the way up here to work, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right, that's the thing, right? Yeah. I still can't believe that. That sounds so wild to me. But you think of those stories that we've been telling here mm -hmm. uh, this whole time and how uh, I just can't get over it, it and all of it culminating in last night. And Yeah, in a way, right. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think people know, right? I mean, in my own story with my grandfather coming as a really young, pr like 14 years old from, from Italy and whatever, I don't think people, like, project out that you know, the grandson me will be sitting here doing this, right? <laughs> I don't think people, um, I don't think, I think you aspirationally, any, any parent I imagine, I mean, I can only speak for, I can't speak for all parents, but parents I know all want their kids to do better, whatever that means, be yeah. more economically secure, be more healthy, be more socially secure, whatever it is, right? right. You, you generationally want to do that. And in the larger story of America, I mean, that's certainly the case um, to a degree, right? Although now it's up for grabs again because I think we're, I mean, with widening inequality and other things we've talked about, it's not so obvious anymore that, that, this, that, that your generation is going to do better necessarily right, then. Yeah. And certainly kids that are in college now that are coming away with huge debt and such, it's not always clear to me that they're going to do better off socially, economically. Yeah. Um, than, than their parents and their grandparents did. I don't know. I mean, my generation was blessed by having the generation before ours benefit from the GI Bill and from all these other things that these so when, when the country didn't mind thinking that we should have these big social programs <laughs> that will help people yeah. um, and that will, you know, uplift the, the, the entire country at the same time. Now we're fighting, we're, we're fighting about a shrinking pie and if we're not careful, mm -hmm. we fight against each other for a smaller slice of the little pie. Exactly. Um, and then we end up with things like last night. But fortunately, that, that's not what happened last night. The opposite yeah. happened. Yeah, and that's so, so. beautiful. And, and the stories that came out, it's like, we're all just trying to get a piece of the pie. <laughs> and let's, let's just bake a bigger pie for everybody. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's not have the <laughs> president's um, Star Wars, whatever it was he wants in the budget, Space Force. Yes. He's <laughs> watch, he watched Spaceballs, the movie, maybe one too many times. That was, oh, yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't let him get ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's dangerous. Yep. You know, and I think about that too, those those young people, right, that were there, like the generations that we're talking about and how this generation right now, um, folks like me who are swimming in debt, but, you know, we're just trying to make it. And I see, um, you know, thinking of Lowell as like a philanthropy town too, right? Um, those young people that were there last night, those are, the, those are going to be the people who are going to then make it a better place again. And yep. hopefully their generations will be the leaders mm -hmm. after that. And I feel like that's 
that's the kind of thing that I see in Lowell happening. Right. And we go through those cycles, right? Like I think about when all the tech was coming here and then when it all died down and all of the times that we were a ghost town. <laughs> right. But we always revive ourselves and it's because of the power of community. Yeah, and what we don't want to do, I think, at least in my opinion, we don't, we don't want to regress around these questions of civil, social, humanitarian mm -hmm. rights because I think one of the things that I find interesting having taught for such a long time at the university is so many people who come to Lowell to go to school then stick around who didn't come from here. And part of the reason that a lot of the, at least the students I stay in touch with that I had, a lot of the reason they stick around is because Lowell is this really interesting, eclectic, yeah. cosmopolitan, diverse kind of a place. And so if you turn your back on that or as a city or sort of walk away from that or shun that as a city, then what's going to happen is more and more those, those those generational shifts won't get made. Exactly. And then you'll end up with this really skewed population in, in Lowell where you have a lot of people over 70 and a lot of people under 15. Mm -hmm. And you have no middle because everybody, when they start reaching sort of their economic earning potential and whatever, they leave. Skedaddle. Um, yeah. And so it's really incumbent on the city to create the atmosphere that will you know, that will do that. I mean, and I think that's the, the large question still in front of the city is the schools. Yes. Because I think the thing now that's a stumbling block to keeping people in town over time is the quality of the e quality of education. Certainly, I think people are struggling around those issues of budget and such. But yeah. this affects immigrant refugee kids mm -hmm. and it affects all kids. So if you're improving the schools for any particular grouping of people, you're improving the schools for everybody. Exactly. So again, we can't look at it as, well, if you get stuff, I don't, mm -hmm. right? And and if, if we can sort of keep that in the forefront yeah. um, through the start of the next decade, we'll be way better off. Yes, and maybe this is a really great way to end this decade <laughs> on that, you know, on that note. This is our last story of this decade. <sighs> Wow. That actually, that's a, this is a heartwarming story. Wow, <laughs> Lowell, Lowell did it again. <laughs> we could say that. We could. And, and I think it's, you know, I criticize our local government a lot because, well, we live in America and I have the right to do that. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that with all the criticisms and all the things that can be said about our local government, I think last night was a really great example of a step forward mm -hmm. in the right direction. Absolutely. And maybe, you know, them listening to all the anecdotes and sharing their own, I, maybe there was a bridge built there mm -hmm. and, and hopefully we'll be able to crowd, meet on meet yes. in the middle. A well, bridge not too far. I was just going to say, maybe Lowell has enough bridges. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we need one more <laughs> yeah. or well, two. Construction for the next decade. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it, it really is um, one of those impactful things in a heartwarming mm -hmm. moment. And, I, and I'm grateful that we could experience it right now. Mm -hmm. And with all of the things going on in the world, in our political climate, and all the things that we're not really sure about, this is a really good thing. Yep. So, yes, yeah. I agree. Thanks, Bob. And so it goes. Happy 2020, yes. everybody. Happy 2020. Thank you, viewers at home. This was History and Lowell.